So. Right, so let's give two minutes to people to just join in. So we already have a significant number of participants, which is really great. And just for those of you who are now joining us, a brief reminder that the session is being recorded. And uh, this is unusual for us, but we're exploring this format this year and it's still unclear whether and how we will post them, but we will, we will explore that possibility. And for those of you already in the audience, uh, please, I ask you to um, pre prepare any of your questions in the Q&A, and I will be happy to read them afterwards. All right, so let's get started. It's my amazing pleasure to welcome today to our exceptional session, because we, we hadn't actually planned for this, but one of those serendipitous visits to the many, to the 85 Max plants led to this, you know, where I, you know, asked Patrick, like, would I, can, can I just ask you for an hour and a half to ask you, you know, questions about how did you become our, our president? And, you know, he was very generous enough, not only to serve as president, but also to come now today to talk to us about his career and how he grew up in academia. Um, so I prepared as usual, his, I will tell you a little bit about his stellar CV. Um, I prepared already a page, and, and this I can tell you already that I have summarized significantly all of the prizes, because if I read the prizes and 250 publications, we will take you know, a full day. Um, so I just highlighted some of the aspects of you know, his extremely interesting career, and then I will leave the word to Patrick to tell us more or less the story about him you know, in the unofficial part. So, all right, so who is Patrick Kramer? Um, he studied chemistry at the University of Stuttgart and Heidelberg from 1989 to 1994. He completed a part of his studies as an Erasmus scholar at the University of Bristol. He carried out his diploma thesis with Alan Ferns in Cambridge, where he became acquainted with structural biology. He received his doctorate from the University of Heidelberg in 1998, working in the research group of Christoph Müller at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Grenoble, France. And during his postdoc at Stanford, he determined the first structure of an eukaryote RNA polymerase when working with Roger Kronberg, which that actually led to a science paper in, 20, in 2001. Roger Kronberg later on in 2006 received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the structural basis of transcription. In 2001, he received a tenure track professorship in biochemistry at the Gene Center of the LMU where he was appointed full professor of biochemistry and head of the research center in already 2004, in three years. He headed the Gene Center at the University of Munich for 10 years and also served as Dean of the Faculty of Chemistry and Pharmacy from 2007 to 2009, as director of the Department of Biochemistry from 2010 to 2013, and a spokesperson of the Collaborative Research Center of the German Research Foundation from 2008 to 2013. Uh, in 2014, uh, he was appointed director of the Max Planck Institute of Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen, um, where he is heading the molecular biology department. And from 2014 to 2020, he also was a member of the Perspective Commission of Biological Section, which for a time he was also a, a chairman. In 2022, he also served as an executive director of the Max Planck Institute for Multidisciplinary Natural Sciences, the largest institute of the Max Planck Society, and He's appointed president-elect of the Max Planck Society as of June 2013, so congratulations. The main focus of Patrick Kramer's research is on gene in transcription, in particular, the way in which cells without information store in the genome. He has deciphered the three-dimensional uh, structure of RNAs polymerase, one of the largest enzymes in the cell nucleus, and thereby elucidated the essential part of the, of the transcription mechanism. 
His findings form the basis for better research into diseases such as cancer, in which a transcription of genetic materials is misdirected. And together with his team, he also contributed to important findings about the coronavirus. For example, the researchers succeeded in visualizing how SARS-CoV-2 copies its genetic material and in clarifying how several COVID-19 drugs can prevent this process. But Kramer has received several awards for his research. Among others, he received the Hector Science Prize in 2021, the, in 2015, the Arthur Booker Prize. He's also the recipient of the Leibniz Prize of the German, German Research Foundation in 2006, the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany in 2012, uh, and in 2020, the National Academy of Science in the US accepted him as an international member. He has published over 250 scientific papers, most of those in extremely prestigious journals such as Science and Nature, and has already visited 81 institutes out of the 85 that, you know, are, that the Max Planck Society is composed of. And I was asking him before whether or not he gets any sleep. <laughs> and now he's going to tell us about who he is and, and how he became the person that you know, we're talking about today. So thank you, Patrick, for joining us. Oh, well, thank you, Lucia. Uh, is that really me, <laughs> the CV that you just read? Yeah. Um, of course, you know, over the years, things um, happen. And uh, what can I say? I think one misconception is that people think they're in the driver's seat. And I'm um, such a person. <laughs> I always think I want to be in the driver's seat. I want to you know, influence the next steps. I want to take the next steps the way I, you know, wish to do them. But the truth is that the looking back at what you just said, that the the major changes actually occurred to me in some way. So it's not that I deliberately took a decision. It's rather that opportunities occurred and I took them. And, you know, it's sometimes very difficult to distinguish, you know, how, how much driver seat was there and how much opportunity or serendipity or chance. Um, so you mentioned a few things, maybe, you know, if people, I don't want to bore people with all this old stuff, but if people are interested, uh, because maybe they are um, at the beginning of their career, many young researchers, maybe you're interested how these things occurred to me and how I took the decisions. I can probably you know, um, go into some detail with respect to what you mentioned. Um, you know, first thing with studying chemistry, basically what you have to know is that my grades in school were not good enough to do biochemistry. I was always interested in the molecules of life, but at the time there were only three German universities offering biochemistry. And I just didn't get in because my grades were not good enough. And so I thought, well, you know, I'm motivated. So I still try and I started with chemistry. And then for years I tried to move from chemistry to biochemistry to molecular biology. It was very difficult, turned out to be only possible by moving to England. Um, so, you know, I got started and I realized that I cannot stay in Stuttgart. Actually, my parents wanted me to be there. And the reason was very simple because the money was short. So we were three sons and they simply couldn't afford uh, their education. And so I was staying at home, you know, going for two years, four sent back from home to uh, the University of Stuttgart, but I realized I cannot do biochemistry there. So eventually I went to Heidelberg. I, um, you know, I had some savings from parents, but also from grandparents. Uh, and I used them up over the years. And I also tried to get a little bit of money here and there doing little jobs. And I realized in Heidelberg that even there, it wouldn't be possible to move to molecular biology. That had, you know, in the 90s had... Um, political reasons that the professor simply didn't want me to move away from chemistry. 
it was fierce competition for the students. So then I went to England and that's where I first got into molecular biology. So it was much more complicated. And uh, without going into any of the details, uh, you wouldn't believe how I went, how I got to England, because this was a time where people wouldn't use email. You would write letters, you have to wait a week to get a response and so forth. And basically one of the professors said, you know, if you would be good enough to get an offer from Cambridge, then maybe we could consider that. And then I got this offer from Cambridge and the professor would say, um, you know, I reconsidered, you should still stay at Heidelberg. Eventually I got one professor who uh, actually supported me and I could move to Cambridge. And um, that allowed me to get into EMBL. And you know, the funny story is I, I applied to EMBL and I didn't even get invited for interview because people said, oh, it's a chemist, you know, we, Maybe he doesn't know what molecular biology is about. And so I applied again a year later. I got into interview and I wanted to, of course, come back from England to Heidelberg because my girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, she was uh, studying in Germany. So, uh, you know, the idea was if I could go to Heidelberg to be at EMBL. It turns out then I didn't find any match at Heidelberg and eventually... Uh, there was a young group leader who was not even on the list, who was Christoph Müller. He just returned from Harvard and I met him and I went to France. And so I was separated again from my girlfriend for another year. Uh, but she luckily, eventually she moved to Grenoble and we had our first child there, uh, our daughter. Uh, so wonderful connection, you know, that to Grenoble that we still have. And it turned out that it was a great choice to go there. Why? First of all, I didn't know that this new synchrotron, the ESRF, that was just going online, right? Remember, there was also very few web pages. It was very difficult to get information beginning of the 90s. And second, uh, Christoph Müller, you know, he was, of course, he was a young group leader and it was difficult for him to deal with me because I was very ambitious. I was his first student and we got, you know, into some little conflicts, which now we laugh about when we meet each other. <laughs> But, um, uh, you know, it was actually a great decision because he brought the latest in structural biology that I could learn from him. And it was only because of that training that then I could go to Stanford and actually solve this big problem of, you know, visualizing RNA polymerase for the first time, which really, I think, changed the field because this black box that we had at the heart of gene transcription was opened. And now suddenly everybody could see how uh, the polymerase works, and that really changed the field of transcription. So you see how the things are connected, and you only understand retrospectively uh, why these decisions were good decisions. I think um, many of these things happened to me. Uh, you know, I was browsing a journal in the library, uh, actually JBC, um, something people don't even bother to read nowadays. But since there was no PubMed alerts or anything, you would go to the library on Friday afternoon, you would open the new journals, and it was all on paper, right? And I would go through the contents, and I saw that somebody could crystallize the polymerase. And, you know, I, I wrote a letter to Roger Kornberg, and I met him eventually and decided to do that, and that changed my career. So you see that for each of these um, steps uh, along my career, something there was an opportunity that then, of course, I had to also take. And it was important to talk to my wife and also to family uh, to be sure it's the right decision. And I was very lucky in that respect that uh, my wife would always support me with this. Maybe if you allow me another minute or two, I can talk about the later stages briefly, but I don't want to bore people. Um, you know, when I was in, in the US, this was already the seventh year that I was abroad, you know, England, then France, then California. And basically, there was no connection to Germany anymore. Uh, our second kid was born, our son. Uh, in California. So now we also have a connection to the US. He has an American passport. Um, so that's wonderful. But at that time, you know, we there was no reason why should we go back to Europe. And we considered actually staying in the US. And there was already phone calls from 
a university uh, at the East Coast. They were interested to talk to me and so forth. But then again, I was browsing a newspaper and there was an announcement uh, for a tenure track position at Munich. And I thought, you know, must be a mistake in the print because the Germany that I knew from the 90s was there was no tenure track, right? It just didn't exist. There was only what was called the habilitation. So you have to qualify for a professorship by serving, you know, in at your school for years and years, and eventually you would move to a professorship. And so I, I didn't want to do that. So I was thinking to stay in the US. But then um, you know, it turns out that the professor in Munich who was putting this announcement, he has been in the US for 14 years. So he was trying to implement the US tenure track system. And I actually got the first tenure track professorship in Germany in March 2001. And Karl Peter Hopfner, uh, my colleague, got another one two months later. And together, we basically now wanted to demonstrate that we can change the system, that it actually works. You know, it was a huge burden lying on us because imagine if we would have been a total disaster, you know, not being able to teach, not being able to publish, not being able to get money or people. But eventually, it was very hard work, but we, we demonstrated that. And actually, also, Carl Peter had soon very great offers and I think it was a success model and now many universities as you know in Germany are, are following this so at that time you know I, I realized that when you live your life you're actually part of history and this is a message that I have for everyone who's listening for the young people um, you know try to be in the driver's seat try to make use of your time try to listen to people but take decisions yourself but also make use of your opportunities even if it's totally different from what you expected i mean you can imagine i was in england trying to go to germany and now somebody tells me you can go to france right and that was a time when people would not use email and so forth and it was very expensive to travel also there was no mobile phones to stay in touch and so it was a big thing but you know i talked to my girlfriend at the time and uh, we agreed on how we do it, and it all turned out to be wonderful. We got to know a new culture. I didn't speak a word of French, except for merci, mademoiselle, bonjour. And, you know, I, I learned the language a little bit, and it's opened up all this wonderful culture, you know, the... Um, ever since we are addicted to cheese um, beforehand, we didn't didn't eat much. So what I want to say is, you know, once you open yourself up and you say, okay, I'm in the driver's seat, but I also I'm open to totally unexpected opportunities. That's also good for the science because that's the basis of serendipity. This is not just pure luck. You know, Pasteur once said that it's uh, the prepared mind uh, will be hit by chance, right? It's not just pure chance. It's you have to have a prepared mind. Maybe that much, uh, maybe one last sentence. I think the format uh, that you have established here is really something very exciting. It's very, very difficult to get me nervous. But, you know, when I saw this morning in my agenda that um, my eighth or tenth um, appointment today is, is the growing up in academia, I was a little bit nervous. And But now it's good. Um, first 10 minutes you have to overcome. But thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure because I know that one of the things that I really wanted the students and everyone in the audience to get is, um, you know, like I said, the, 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 what I take from these humble, you know, like starts and all of these, you know, like wines and et cetera, is that it's also the passion, yeah. right? And I want, you know, like one of the things that I want to, to with, this, with this format to tell people is that life is that way. Like also things happen to us, right? And I, I really love the, the idea of this, you know, relying on serendipity at the same time but being prepared you know to take the opportunities right um so then let me bring you back to the to your very you know start because what i what i you know what i wonder how did you keep your dream up despite all you know what, what i what i heard is things were really really complicated Professors, you know, did not want you to move from one faculty to another for political reasons, so completely irrational. It's not, it has nothing to do with, you know, like how good or bad a student you were, right? You get the offer from Cambridge, they just dismiss it, you know, like you don't get the offer from the AMBL, even though, you know, like 
really, you know, like you you were you know, like a very good candidate, right? So so how did you how did you keep your you know your spirit up and your dream up despite all of those, and and, and especially when you are just a student, right? When you're just starting your career, you're you don't have the self confidence, you know. The family, as I, as I understood now, like there were also like financial sacrifices for your families. There were also like emotional sacrifices for your partner, you know, like and your future wife at the time. So it just seemed a pretty rough start. So how did you navigate that? Uh, the the truth is that there were maybe two, maybe three times where I was about to give up. That's the truth. Um, but, but, and but I. You didn't. Yeah, you know, so just to give you one example, I eventually had this offer from England, and I would formally apply in Heidel at Heidelberg University that this is formally accepted as part of my study, so I could do my master thesis. At that time, it was called the diploma, and they told me uh, you cannot even apply for it. We don't even take the application in, and I asked why, and they said because you're not a trained scientist yet. And, you know, when I went to England, the first thing they told me is the opposite. They said, you know, you may not have a degree yet, but you can contribute. You can contribute. Everybody can contribute. And this was so motivating. But uh, to be honest, yeah, I was uh, close to give up a couple of times. This was one time where I thought, okay, it's, the academic system is so rigid and so suppressive, at least in chemistry in the 90s, you know, it has changed entirely, as you know, um, that it's not for me because, you know, I don't want to change my personality and become one of them. That was one thing. And then also after my PhD, you know, I was close to give up because there's always the question, what about, you know, now we already have a child, we're very short of money. Then actually the first, I asked for a fellowship. I'm not telling you which one, but you wouldn't believe when you, Hear it. I was asking for fellowship. I want to solve the polymerase structure and I will do it at Stanford and they have everything I need and I have all the knowledge I need. And it was turned down and the justification was that great proposal, absolutely stunning and this is what the field needs, but it's technically not possible. But this was the greatest encouragement I got in my life because I wanted to show the old professors that it's technically possible. So I was super motivated after that. But it need, you know, basically somebody hits you a little bit on the head and you, but then you have to get back up. And that's my message. I think the important thing is when you're about to give up or when you think, um, uh, you know, I'm, I cannot handle this. This is too much. Then to actually sleep over it, talk to somebody you trust, family, your partner, a friend, and get back up and then you know if this is really what listen to your heart and do it of course then i could have failed but then at least i would have said okay i tried you know i'm i'm happy with what i've done i tried for a couple of years and now i will go to industry i could have said that right but the um the issue why i was close to giving up is of course the responsibility then you feel for your partner for your child then the second child in in the us and that was the third time where i was close to give up because um it's not really known um this story but basically what happened after half a year we were entirely bankrupt because we didn't have a penny when we went to the us we got then the second fellowship uh, four days before the flight left but can you imagine you already have a little child of, of a year year age um and you you don't know what you you know gonna live on of course then roger kornberg said you know in the worst case i can always bridge you for a couple of months or so but it's not a great perspective when you're a young daddy it's a bit um you know uh but wait, let, let me pause you here so did i hear right that you had bought a flight you had your wife and your kid and you got the fellowship four days before yeah four days before the flight yeah. wow so did you have a plan B? Sorry? <laughs> did oh, you plan, have a plan B. B? <laughs> uh, no. And, and, and that was yeah. actually, uh, you know, very important in my thesis committee. There was somebody called Hank Stunenberg. I don't know if people know him. He is a genomics person who went from EMBL to the Netherlands. And I talked to him what about plan A, B, C and so forth. And he said, forget about it. 
you should never have a plan B because that basically means that you, you're not fully committed, right? Mm -hmm. You come up with a plan B when the time comes. And so I did that. And actually, um, after half a year at Stanford, we were totally running out of money. I mean, talking that you're not able to pay the rent of the next month. This was Silicon Valley. It was before the bubble collapse. So actually, um, you know, uh, the new market was... There were all these new million dollar homes around our home. We were living next to the train. It was the only place we could afford, but it was already like 60% of the fellowship, just the rent. But then the three of us had to live on a couple of, couple of hundred dollars. So it was very difficult. And so eventually I just uh, went to my supervisor and overnight he basically from, you know, the family, they had a family foundation. He just brought a check with cash and he gave it to me and at the time that was the only way to uh, keep going for the next months wow what did your wife say you know i mean you know like i, I also have kids so so i think that these are, these are the things that you know like the, the the sacrifices that we do for science I mean, sometimes to be are... honest i think my wife is the success factor here because okay. if you're all on your own right you can be a cool dude um yeah, I will get past somehow, you know, but if you have responsibility for other people, and since my wife couldn't work uh, because she needs to use the German language, she's actually in social sciences, she's a social worker, um, you know, she, of course, we could have asked our parents, right? But how do you feel when you have a PhD, when you move to California, to Stanford University, you know, one of the top places, and now you call your parents because you run out of money. We were not prepared to do that. Uh, we didn't want to do that. And so the success factor is my wife, because she said, you know, it's a difficult situation, but people before us had even more difficult situations. So we will maybe do this, do that. And she was very relaxed. And that, of course... Um, Wow. provided a good foundation for my decisions for sure for sure but you know now that i talk about it i haven't thought about that for a long time it's it was there were three points where i was about to give up and you know and one of the things that you know that has been kind of like a recurrent topic you know like through this series is that all of us have those stories because sometimes academia really asks a lot from us you know yeah. like in the sense of you know like you know what you just what you just do <laughs> like you know you apply for this grant you have a great idea and they shut you down because they don't believe that you that you can do it and then you did it in three years without money you know what I mean? like, this is you know like that how could how could people know what you can what you can do you know and besides well, you know, like you know that it doesn't feel like three years it feels like six or eight because there was not much sleep I was at in the night I was at the synchrotron and. But it was fun because I knew I'm up to something very, very big and it could eventually even be my life assurance, you know, for the whole family. And it, it was then in the end. Um, yeah. So, but, but, can, but can you, you, were, you were saying, Lucia, that uh, science is asking for a lot. You know, with these experiences, I, when I came back and uh, I saw then that we still have the fellowships for the PhD students, they have problems to survive in Munich. I was always supportive. First, the first thing was to go from 50 to 65%. This was already done during my Munich time, and I was very much pushing. Colleagues were against it because obviously then you can afford less people and you get in trouble with your consumable money and so forth. But I was really fighting for this. And the second thing was when I got to Max Planck and there was a discussion amongst colleagues, uh, should we go from fellowships to contracts? I was fighting for contracts. Because, you know, I thought, you know, if we can avoid such a situation that I went through for the next generation, I we have to avoid it. And it basically meant that, you know, there was now hundreds of PhD students less in the Max Planck Society, several hundred because of the change. But those we take in, actually, at least they have, you know, a better life they, with the insurances. We didn't have any of that. So actually from all that time uh, in England, France, the US, I, you know, I didn't have uh, the support for social security, no pension payments, nothing. It was all fellowships, fellowships. And uh, it's the same for my wife. Um, so it's not that I want to complain, but I, I just want to, you know, tell people that when you experience something like this, 
you change your personality and then when you get in power yourself and you have a possibility to do change you will do the change because you know how difficult it is if you don't go through such difficult times i think you probably will decide otherwise in some instances yeah and I can tell you because you know, like I had, you know, in the Mac, I was part of the Max Tank Society fellowship students, you know, back in the day when you know, there were more fellowships than you know real conference, right? And, and you, that 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 was just you know like how it was, right? Um, but but I, and I agree with you that part of the responsibility of growing up in academia is taking the experiences that one made and making the future better for the others, right? And making sure that you know whatever one experienced. It should not be repeated. I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, like if one already suffered from it, why should make others to suffer from, from it as well, right? Um, maybe we, we will get to talk to you know about you know your your ideas for 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 you know the presidency of the Macdonald Society. But before we go there, I want to ask you something that you know like I found really, you know, so A, I'm very surprised that you did not have a plan B. Like, you know, like I and I and I understand the reasons, but I think that this is very courageous. Right, yes and more. yeah, yes and no, because I mean, as you know, you could always say at some stage when you have your PhD degree, right? You could always say now I apply it industry or so. So in in it's in that sense, there you know there would have been an easy plan B in in the worst case to just apply to some company and feed my family, right? So, but of course that would have been a frustration with all you know the ten years of investment into science and becoming a, a strong scientist so that would have been frustrating yeah for sure now, now let me take you to this very difficult period in stanford right because what i find really surprising is like you know you got you know you, you read this jbc paper then you decided to go to this professor without a fellowship and with the strong determination that you were going to solve a problem that people had not been able to solve for years you didn't pick a small problem <laughs> you picked the problem you know, so how do you do that? And then have the guts to say, like, I will do it. And then you did it. So, so how, how does that work? It's a good question. I think part of it is being naive. Mm -hmm. Simply not knowing how difficult it is. Uh, and some of the old professors knew that the face problem is not going to be solved with current detectors. But during my time at Stanford, there was a new detector you know, which gave a better signal to noise. So it's the mistake that we make sometimes when we think about a problem and whether it can be solved or not is that we just assume what we do, but the whole world is changing and suddenly there will be a solution from around the corner that you don't even know of. And this is serendipity also to some extent. But yeah, it, I was naive to some extent. I knew it's it's a very, very big problem because obviously otherwise somebody like, you know, Tom Stites or so, some of the big, you know, structural biologists would have solved it. I knew it's a big problem, but uh, the issue was, you know, I was a trained crystallographer. So I had a PhD, I was trained. Now, what do you do next? I was thinking the next step has to be not more of the same, but I have to attempt to solve a big question. And if I'm, you know, there will be risk, but if I make it, then I may be able to compete for a PI position. So that's why I took the risk also. And the, the, another big reason was a frustration towards the end of my PhD that, you know, I was working on transcription, on transcription factors. In the end, you see these transcription factors, but you still don't understand how transcription works. And so, because you don't know the machine that is carrying out transcription, which is the polymerase. So it was also the scientific frustration that we have to take a big step, you know, not just one more transcription factor, but look at the machine itself. So it was a combination of being naive, being super ambitious, you know, trying to prepare for the next step. And then also um, uh, that scientifically that was, it was clear in the transcription field, this is the holy grail, as we say, right? That's what everybody's looking for to get, right? And so it was a combination. Can you tell us more about, you know, like that period? Like, you know, how did you find it? Like, how did you experience, like, I found it? Like, it must have been like a, gosh, <laughs> I don't know, like, you know, I, I get goosebumps just by thinking about it, you know, like, I mean, you mean I once I, right? right? So it's, you know, you mean once I solved the problem? Or... Yes. 
They yeah, deny I mean, that, you know, whatever. I don't know when, when that happened or how that happened, but I can imagine at some point you yeah. figure out, like, oh, I got it. Uh, uh, it's exactly like you say. It's exactly like you say. And why is that so? Because in crystallography, you can measure data, right? But you cannot phase uh, the diffraction data. And once you get those phase, this phase information, then you suddenly solve it. Basically, that's that moment when you solve the structure. Because you see noise in your electron density, noise, noise, noise. And then there will be the one day where you have phase information and that noise will suddenly look like a protein. So you will see a polypeptide, you know, going. And um, that day was uh, when I was when early in the morning. I was always working at the synchrotron, you know, starting three or four o'clock in the morning because they fill the machine with fresh electrons, right? And then the first people came at seven. So I always use those four hours or so in between. And so, uh, you know, I got this, what is called an anomalous difference Fourier map. And that map showed eight peaks. And of course, you know, I was looking for one year, I was looking at noise, 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 and suddenly I get these eight peaks. And, you know, it, it just crossed my mind, you solved it, and I, I jumped up. And why did I know? Because um, from prediction, you know, looking at um, cysteine residues in the proteins, you, you, we knew that it binds eight zinc ions. And the data that I had collected was the anomalous signal of the zinc edge. So once you have phase information, you can then find those zinc atoms. And that was the first thing that was ever seen of the polymers were these eight zinc ions because I had the anomalous diffraction signal from those zinc ions. And so I jumped up, the chair was falling over. I was at the synchrotron, you know, it's a huge machine. Um, uh, I was alone in the morning, maybe, you know, five o'clock, six o'clock. And I went outside and you have to go up a little bit on the hill and then you have the Silicon Valley is underneath and I could see the sun rising over the Bay Area and I knew, you know, this will change my entire life because everybody will know, you know, this guy solved the old problem of getting the polymerized structure. It's just going to be work. But this was the one second where I was sure that I got it. Wow, what, you know, when, when you came back home, what did you say to your wife? Good morning. Wow, well, no, <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow, and then what, what about when you talk to your mentor? He must have been um, astounded, no? Yeah, Roger was uh, a very, he's a very supportive person, very, um, um, yeah, you know, he wants to know the details. He's not going to interfere with you. He doesn't do any micromanagement. So he didn't go to the synchrotron or anything. And he didn't say, can, can you come to my office and show nothing like that. Um, and he also spends about four months or so a year in Israel. His wife is Israeli. So I'm not even sure whether on that day he was in Israel or at Stanford. But of course, I told him and he was overwhelmed with joy because he was working on that problem for so long. Um, actually, when people told him that it cannot be solved, you know, 10 years earlier. He decided to go into that problem as well. Yeah, he was, you know, his father was working on DNA replication, and then he was working on transcription, the natural next step, right, in the um, dogma, if you wish. Um, but the, the the difference is, of course, you have very small DNA polymerases, like the Kleno fragment or so, and now suddenly you look at this RNA polymerase with 12 proteins, half a megadalton, uh, you know, over 4,000 amino acids, um, 40,000 atoms. And in the 90s, this was a huge challenge. There was never a protein structure solved of that size. Uh, so it was technically, you know, now we love about it. We have electron microscopy and so forth. But it was, there was never a crystal structure of a, as asymmetric protein of that size solved before. So, and it, never... maybe for, you know, he was also maybe naive to some extent and just knew that this is a big question and one day we will do it. And I think that is the, the attitude we need. I mean, why naive? I mean, it's the problem is to have answers, right? One just needs to work on them. If nobody works on the problem, it will never be that's solved. Right? That, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. But, but no, you know... Then... You know, Luisa, uh, when, Lucia, when, when I take in students or postdocs, I have to balance, right? Because they may have family or they 
may want to move back to their home country and they want to get a degree or paper. Um, so on one hand, you have to give out a very ambitious project to do big science like you envision. On the other hand, um, you need to balance the risk so that they get their PhD or their paper. And um, it also depends on the type of person. You know, one in five or so is the kind of person who says, either I get this or okay, I want to take that risk, you know. And then those people often do great things. And often it's ha happening in the last moment, you know, when you think it's not going to work. I, I could tell you many examples now. No, I would love to, to go back to what you just said, because uh, I, I wrestle with exactly this point. You know, do we, why do we need to play the like numeracy here? Why, what is so wrong about, you know, like I tried for four years and, I didn't find, and then I didn't find it. I mean, like, yeah, you know, this is, this is something I ask myself all the time. Mm. Why do we need to, you know, why do we need to, you know, buy, you know, create all of these backup plans? You know, yeah. like, we don't know. I mean, science, you know, like we don't know. You know, like, there is there is answers out there. But anyway, so we, we will we will talk about that. But let me let me ask you a a a, a question before. Um, I am pretty sure that you know after you solved that big problem, you were a rock star in science. Right, so you know, and I'm pretty sure that they offered. You know, you mentioned that you got an offer from the East Coast. I'm pretty sure it was a very good university from the East Coast. So why did you ever consider coming back to Germany that had treated you so badly? Um, I think one thing that was that the offer was unexpectedly good. As I told you, this was a colleague who was socialized in the American system and was not you know connected to the old german system so he really wanted to do a real tenure track five years evaluation tenure and he also was offering uh, very good conditions um, more money than you would normally get at this age even more than what they could have done for me yes. at this american university mm -hmm. but the money is just one thing right you need to have good colleagues you need to have access to good co-workers you need to have you should be able to recruit students and so that was one expect that actually the offer was good the second is of course that uh, munich is a good place right it's a good place to raise family it's a good place it's expensive but you have all the opportunities and it's a good place to do science to connect to other people and the third thing was of course that you know we i remember that my wife and i we were talking um, you know, either we now now we go back to Europe uh, before the kids go to school, because at the time, you know, they were, I think, one year and maybe th three, four years old. Um, so either we do it now or they will go to school in the US and then we probably go back, the two of us and the kids will be American, right, um, because they don't. They don't know Europe. Why should they be there? What's what's the point, right? So that was also part of the decision. Um, whether it was the right decision, I, I think so. I, th I mean, we feel comfortable here, and um, uh, I think the German system has changed really dramatically, supporting people better, getting rid of some of the uh, you know breaks that were always um, in the way of people. So. I don't regret it, but um, yeah, these were the reasons why we in the end chose to go back. One thing that is surprising, you know, like is that, you know, again, speaking of serendipity, that you got this first uh, tenure track position, and it's still the fact that the LMU is perhaps the university in the, in the German system that has a really proper tenure track system. Because, you know, to be honest, you know, there's many universities within Germany that claim that they have a tenure track system, but you know, but we know that it's really yeah. not like in the US. You know, like it's just really not the case. You know, and I think it's surprising because you know if you think about that like you were a success story, you know, for sure. Yeah. So we know that the tenure track system actually works, right? Um, but for whatever reason it seems that it did there's a it takes a lot of you know momentum, so to speak, mm -hmm. to change things, you know. Uh, so it, yeah. do, you, do you do you do you have because when you have hold a lot of you know uh, you know high rank positions in the administration as well like you know do you have an insight as to why is it so stubborn the system in some sense you know like so um yeah this is, would be a long discussion but I think one of the reasons is that 
human beings always uh, tend to stick to what they have because there will be the argument, you know, it generally works. Um, we're not sure if this is going to be better and then we cannot go back and all these things. And then of course there's questions like who is liable if there's an, like at the university, right? You have a practical course and do we really want a very young person to be liable for, you know, when people put phenol on, on their skin or something. Um, so there's all these arguments and some of them are true arguments. Some of them are simply that people are conservative. When I spot this, then I go to the, you know, I put my finger in and I want to know the real reason because, you know, it's important to have a, a real discussion. What is the advantages? What is the disadvantages? What are the opportunities that we may miss? And I think also for the Max Planck Society, that's the discussion we are currently having. You know, how much tenure track do we want? To what extent, and that is a serious question, would that actually lead to more... Um, you know, conservative science, because people probably in the beginning, they're very careful, they want to get tenure, and then they don't fly. And to what extent does that actually provide an opportunity? Because we bring in a lot of young people with new technologies, new ideas, um, new motivation. So I think uh, what we're currently, um, I think, up to, to actually increase the uh, number of tenure track positions, at least in some fields. Uh, we keep the Lise Meitner, but have additional, uh, you know, tenure track positions that are open for all genders, for example, in computer science and quantum science. And at the same time, keep the free floaters because uh, it works, right? Um, it's a success story. Uh, about 95% of those people um, uh, get really good jobs, many of them professorships. So it's a good compromise, you know, to keep both systems, but it may change dramatically when they change this law, the federal law, the Wissenschaftszeitvertragsgesetz, then it may change and we have to then react, but maybe it's an opportunity, you know, uh, you have to look at it positively. One thing is for sure, just to keep doing what we do is not good enough. Right. That uh, the only thing that is for sure is the change, and we all have to be willing to change things and to um, agree on what is the best possible changes for you know keeping the next generation the best people, the talent in science. And this this taps with what we were trying to discuss before in terms of this, don't we have failure under failure underrated in science? I mean, don't we have failure? Under failure, rate, failure. You know, in the sense that, you know, like, this is, this is a question that, you know, it keeps coming back, you know, like, because I feel that we learn through mistakes. Like, you know, like, if everything works, you know, you get confirmatory evidence. So in principle, you don't really know until, you know, okay, you can see your molecules, you know, that, okay, then you can see, but, you know, in my field, you know, like, you can have a hypothesis and then so long I don't fail, I cannot really prove that this is what it is. I can just say that, well, I don't have evidence against, that's it, right? Um, you know, so sometimes say, you know, and I think that is for this, you know, as, as in science as in general, but also for PhD students. So what's the problem of, you know, trying really hard and then not cracking the problem? You know, like, you see what I mean? Like, why, why is that a problem? No. Why is oh, that I, a... I agree with you. And, you know, it, it actually extends to administration, for example. So, um, you know, the rules and regulations have become so difficult that administrators, they wouldn't tell normally, but often they are afraid to take a decision because right. they may make, they may, there will be a failure or they may make a mistake, you know, and what we need to provide, this is important for every leader, a leader needs to you know, I have sometimes not managed to do it, but I really try to, to do that. A leader needs to provide a safe space because within those safe spaces, there can be failure and then people admit that they made a mistake or that they, you know, did something wrong or they need help, they need advice and so forth. And that you, you have to have the right working atmosphere. And so I just to give you an example, um, we always have our group meetings and people, you know, report in front of the group. And sometimes people feel uncomfortable because they will be criticized. They will be asked, why didn't you, you know, I, I already, last time I talked, I, I said, you know, it works like this or so. But you have to have 
an atmosphere where people speak up, where people also report their failures. So sometimes we have group talks where people report half a year of failed experiments because they report every half year for the whole group, right? And so it can happen that they say, you know, when I talked half a year ago, that we agreed that the best way forward would be this and that. And now I show you, I tried this, I failed, I tried this, I failed. I tried this. And so this must be possible, you know. It's not only about the shiny things. I mean, much of science is about things that we tried and didn't work. And um, it even can be good, you know, if a postdoc reports that for a young student to see that uh, science works like this, you know, it's um, many, many trials and trial and error. So we have to have that safe space. And I try to do it. Um, I may have managed, you know, from time to time. Sometimes maybe I failed in this. But uh, I want to try and do that also in the, you know, at the headquarters. So that people who run um, a department at the headquarters, that they are um, willing to take the risk and take a decision and move on. So we will be faster. We will be more efficient. There will be a better working atmosphere. Um, and that is, it's very difficult. We are 650 people there at the headquarters. Um, but I want to I give a that. speech along those lines, you know, that people have, there has to be a culture of um, being, you know, open that you made a mistake or that you need help or that you need advice. I mean, I think that the, the problem is that, you know, like in science, you know, we don't have a journal for things that didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> we should, you know, which I think that in terms of the accumulation of you know knowledge, I think that that's actually important that we know that you know because if we if we report on the things that we know that don't work, we also spare those paths to other people, right? But there is no true outlet for those ideas, right? Um, let me take you to another point, which you know you you mentioned the. You know serendipities and technical developments. You know, like so sometimes things just need. You know, we need great ideas, but sometimes we need technology, mm -hmm. right? Um, and one of the things that I see these days is that with all of this AI thing, I mean, we have the alpha fold and you know, like ChatGPT in my field. So, and I, you know, and I'm truly, I don't know what to tell to my students at this point. Like, should you go into industry or should you stay in academia? <laughs> because a lot of really exciting things are happening in industry. Right. Um, yeah. And an industry, in fact, actually is a, um, you know, it has two things that I, you know, I have never worked in industry, so I don't really know. But what I see from the outside is there is a team. So there is, so things actually happen sometimes mm -hmm. faster because it's a large team and, and failures are okay. So long you keep trying. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, and I don't know what to tell the generation that is starting their PhDs or even considering going to academia now, because I don't know what the you know AI people will do. To be honest, like I'm really, I'm so surprised. So it's a it's a very important point that you're making, um, and I think it has two aspects, right? One is how can we stay attractive for the best people, because the industry has become more attractive. I mean, AlphaFold and DeepMind is a good example, but there's many such examples. I just read today that Google also now has experts in digital humanities. They want to rewrite history. And that's, of course, an idea we have also at Max Planck. I've seen it at many institutes. Once, you, For example, you know, we are now going digital for all the court decisions in Africa during the you know, time when there were the colonies. Can you imagine that you can, for the first time, come up with a history of law in on a continent like Africa? And so, of course, for that, you need, um, uh, you know, machine learning and um, a lot of approaches that where they're very good at at Google. So I just learned today that they have now people who look into digital humanities and it will be digital social to, social sciences, computational social sciences. You know, Meta had recently a Nature article. So the, these people are not bad. So that is oh, one aspect, great. you know, that's yeah. one aspect. Industry has become better and then how can we stay attractive? And the second aspect is what could we perhaps do together? because we also have something to offer. You know, I had several conversations actually with um, 
people from DeepMind uh, going, you know, from structures to genomics. Can we explain where things bind over the human genome? Can we predict that? How does it bind differently in cancer cells and so forth? And so they will move in this direction. The question is, can we do something together? And uh, that is, I think, a huge challenge for the time when I'm in office um, because the salaries are different, right? It starts with that. Um, then the, all of the IP issues, when you find something and they want to make money out of it, can you publish? When do you publish? So that is important for us. But uh, the only way to deal with that is to talk openly and be open for dialogue because otherwise there will be parallel um, uh, developments, um, competition even. You know, for the Human Genome Project was like that, right? There were, was a company sequencing and there was the scientific consortium sequencing. You can do it like that. Maybe it's even better. But I somehow think we have to form also bridges to these big uh, companies. And we have some collaborations already. For example, Saarbrücken, the uh, institute in Saarbrücken, they have um, collaborations, I think, with Amazon, maybe Google also now. I mean, I, I, I see it as an ex I'm super excited about the future because it feels that you know, like things are happening so much faster. But because of that, at the same time, I don't really know what to tell my students because I, like, if I ask myself, like, I don't know where I would actually, had I had to make decision again, perhaps I would go to ministry. Perhaps I would go to the mine. You know, I don't know. You know, like you see, like it's just, you know, I can, I cannot answer that question for myself. So therefore, I, I don't feel that I can advise them. You know. No. Um, so, so I will like, work on that issue and also to, you know, we can stay attractive because what we can offer is really a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, companies like Genentech or so, they also offer quite a bit of freedom, but in the end, you do have to report. And in the end, there is some interest. You know, you may not see it in your everyday life, but it does influence the way you work. And we do have a, also great working conditions at Max Planck. Um, we have the money that we need to do what we want to do, and we have the freedom. And I think we still need more change to be even more attractive to the best computer scientists and the best talents in the next generation. Tenure track is one possibility. Um, this is already, you know, being done at Saarbrück and at other places. Um, but it's not the only one, by the way. Many people also want to come. We have 79% international postdocs, 79%. Mm -hmm. They want to come. They want to, most of them, not everyone, but most of them want to have a few really intense and good years where they prepare for the next step, maybe going back home and taking a professorship. And that is also an opportunity. And here, what I think we should do is that we not just concentrate on partners where it works really well, like you know, for example, China, we have, I think, over a thousand people from China out of those 24,000 employees. Um, but we should also look at uh, new regions in the world where we have little interaction. Africa is one of them, but also Latin America. Um, uh, great people, they are very well educated, very motivated. So that is uh, something I want to strengthen. I want to set up new international centers, new partner groups. Uh, what can we do together? You know, there was a mistake in the past, and that was that we were Eurocentric. Mm -hmm. So we thought we we're the best, and we will export our legal system, and we will export our academic system, and we will, and so forth and so forth. And this has changed, you know, in many parts of the world, people do better than we do at Europe. Mm -hmm. right and we have to learn from each other and to improve and we have to when we talk to people in other regions of the world um, we instead of you know talking down to teaching them we have to be on eye level and we have to really be in a dialogue and that is true for all parts of the world the world has entirely changed and if we miss that opportunity we're in trouble I agree with you. And one of the things, contrary to the 90s, you know, like now we have internet and things, you know, we can be communicated. Like they, they take this, this mod, you know, now we, you are, you know, in your office, I am in mine. So we can do things that before we weren't able to do, right? Let me take you now to the, to the other end of your career, right? So now you're going to become 
the president of the Max Planck Society. And I'm very excited about it. And I think you're going to do a great job, as I told you before. Yes. But it, I still wonder, you know, it's clear to me that you're an extremely driven and curious scientist. And, that, and you have solved over your career many, many, many scientific riddles, right? Now it's, and, and while, you know, you're doing that, you, know, you have sort of a lot of, you know, like also offices, which takes a lot of time, right? Now, perhaps the office that takes the, lo the most amount of time is being the Max Planck president. So, you know, it's definitely going to be the case that your science will pay ahead. So I cannot, you know, like stop and wonder, like, why are you going into this? <laughs> you know, like, because it feels like it's great for me who is in the receiving end, but you know, you who will be paying the cost, what motivates you to do that? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so I will answer um, in a non-diplomatic, non-political, <laughs> and totally honest way. This was a difficult decision, you know. Imagine, I'm now 52, uh, 54 years old, and for uh, 30 years, I was working on this scientific dream. You know, I want to be the one who understands how genes are copied. I want to be the one who, you know, is kind of opening up new frontiers. Can we have totally new approaches to cancer? Can we understand how cells really express the genome rather than, you know, having old schemes, one gene is doing this, one gene. So we were also, as you know, developing a lot of functional genomics and computational biology, even developing language, like you would, we would sit around the table for two, three hours to, trying to develop a language that mathematicians, you know, even engineers, we had some engineers would understand chemists, biologists. So why giving up all of this mm -hmm. after having achieved so much and now being basically at a stage where I can choose the problem and I have all these great people around me and they will get it done somehow and we can accommodate everyone from around the world. Everything is in place. Plus you're at so, your peak, you know, like, so it's not, you know, like I read your PNAS, you know, like into the inaugural paper, you're literally at the peak of your career. So that's why, you know, like, no. so the honest, <laughs> the honest answer is this was a really difficult decision. And um, I think it was, you know, again, talking to my wife very often, you know, going through the forest around um, uh, Göttingen, how can we deal with this? I mean, the simple answer is the following. What would happen if all the people who are active scientists, when they are asked, would you come for an interview, be looking for a new president, would say, no, I'm not interested. I'm just interested in my science. What would happen? What would be the consequence? Will we get an administrator? Will we probably get somebody who has only one ambition, and that is to be, you know, visible and connected to politics or so. Is that the kind of precedent that we want? And so that is actually what older colleagues told me. They said, you know, you have to consider that because somebody has to run for this job and we want an active scientist. So that is one thing that, because, you know, three years ago, I was approached for the first time by a colleague. I was thinking, you know, they are joking because now the lab is running. I mean, why should I do this, right? But then, you know, over time, I reconsidered, and that, that is one thing. The second thing is, of course, the attraction of the job. There's very few science jobs in the world, I would say, where you can, you know, work with so many different colleagues in so many different fields, ranging from the history of art. I was in Florence last week, wonderful, unbelievable, also Rome, all the way to astrophysics. You know, today at 2 p.m., there was public viewing here at Göttingen because the rocket that goes to Jupiter was launched. Can you imagine? There was a piece of equipment built at Göttingen that then went to French Guiana and now took off with the rocket. And it takes only eight years and it will be at Jupiter. <laughs> and we will, get, we will get the best images ever. So hopefully I will stay healthy to see that day uh, of these moons that go around the Jupiter. So can you imagine to be in charge of such a wonderful society with such great colleagues, such a broad range of fields. This lets me grow as a person because it's such a privilege to learn from these colleagues. So that is, you know, the second aspect. 
And then the third aspect is, of course, that um, uh, the laboratory uh, is going to run. We will be smaller. Many people left, already 21 people left to take jobs, uh, PI jobs, you know, professorships, group leader positions uh, in different parts of the world. So our science will go on also in the next generation. I don't have to be afraid that it will be stopped. And, you know, we have a core team here of several scientists, uh, extremely knowledgeable, very, you know, strong personalities who also have the right spirit, right, and who can take over. And for them, it's even a chance because mm -hmm. they can now have maybe, you know, they, they select students themselves, they have own ideas, they come up with own projects, and I can still do two, three big projects that I really would like to conclude. And so... Uh, in the end, it all works out. And I think what is the most important point, last point, is that, you know, if I would look back having missed that opportunity, there may be failure. I will make mistakes. People will criticize me. I will probably take some wrong decisions, fine, but hopefully many good ones. But if I would look back having missed that opportunity and just watching what happens, and maybe disagreeing with this or having a better idea there and being unhappy here, I would have asked myself, you know, you have to totally keep yourself out because they offered you the job and you said no. So I want to look back with, you know, the impression that for some young people, I did something good and I, you know, helped at least a little bit where I could to lead the society into the future and also to prepare the ground for the next generation. Because how did I get into the system? There was the one colleague who said, I want to get this guy and give him a test. I trust him. He's only 32, you know, with young kids and coming from the US. He doesn't even know how German university works, but I will give him the first tenure track position. So we have to remember there's always somebody who helps us to get started. And so if I can do that for some people, I would be very happy. And of course, as a president, you can multiply your efforts. You don't have to look after each person yourself, right? You can mm -hmm. enable the structures. You can recruit directors who have the right mindset, who would also do this thing. So you can actually have a much higher impact. And that's my hope. Uh, if I stay healthy, then I will try my best. Wow. But, you know, what does your wife say about that? Because it's going to be a lot of time. You're going to spend <laughs> even less time at home, right? Yes, but um, um, yeah, I mean, she's she's wonderful. What can I say? For sure. She's, she's, <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's not just that she accommodates this. It would be one thing that she says, okay, I'm, I'm alone this evening again, maybe for the whole week because you're visiting institutes. Uh, that is one thing. But the other thing is that she's such a good coach um, that she, and she's one of the people who say, this was not good, you know, and I need such people. Yes. Uh, she would, of course, also tell me this was good, and, and that's often the case. But if something goes wrong or she has a feeling like mm, maybe not the best idea, she would also speak up. And so that's so great about her. But of course, she, I wouldn't say that she suffers. One would have to ask her. I cannot talk for my wife, but I think she um, also looks forward to, uh, you know, a totally new opportunity in her life. Um, she has to give up her job, which she likes to do here at Göttingen, but it also has the opportunity, you know, for her to do something entirely different. Uh, maybe take a few months to get reoriented. What is it that I want to do over the next years? Um, and we also um return to munich to some extent of course by now we only know very few people there because after 10 years you know you, there's only very few people you still are in touch with but we have a few people so there's also something to look forward to in terms of private life but of course we will miss getting and we will miss our friends here and it's it's hard for her it's tough and this gets forgotten also when we you know talk about leadership that uh, it comes with a huge uh, expense on the private life basically you become a public person and uh, that actually concerns the whole family also the kids right once it's known that this is the son of this is the daughter of uh, their life may change here and there also and that's why you know like i i, I fully 
you know, admire what you're doing. And, and I thank you for, you know, because it's, I, the personal toll is not, it's not small, right? I mean, we only get to see the shiny parts which you think, of course, you're going to get to, you know, like cut the shots now. So that's a, that's a great part of the job. But what we don't talk about is that it also comes with a lot of baggage. <laughs> you know? So it's not just, you know, like, okay, the one who calls the shot. Oh. Is the one that also takes a hit if anything goes south and blah 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 the family you know so so thank you really okay before we go to the questions from the audience which we have some I'm gonna ask you the five rapid fire questions oh no are you ready get serious oh, okay the, the so, answer can be only one sentence so. here we go what is something that people often get wrong about you that people get wrong about me um. Sometimes people think I have no life, <laughs> but <laughs> it's not true because I do take weekends whenever I can, you know, or at least one of the two days. And I try to be uh, home for the evening and I try to do something with the kids. They were just there over Easter. I try to value the holidays. Um, so that's something that people sometimes get wrong. They think, you know, he is probably the only thing he oh, does no. is to write and talk all the time you know. all right so fill in the black vulnerability is dot 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 vulnerability is um mm, you know sometimes i i feel vulnerable when i try to explain and people totally misunderstand uh and i think that you know i I try to be good. I try to make a positive proposal or so, and people get it entirely wrong and they think I'm just a super nasty, bad person. Then I'm feeling vulnerable because I feel helpless in a way. You know, I, I try to, um, because sometimes you have to take tough decisions. It's the same when you run an institute or when you're head of a group. And I explain it, and sometimes it's just. Um, can be very, yeah, you feel vulnerable in that moment. The okay, next one. You're called to do something brave, but your fear is real and stuck in your throat. What is the first thing you do? So, you know, fear is a super strong word. I'm trying to think when I was really in fear. I would say I'm, you know, sometimes I may be not sleeping well because I'm nervous or because maybe I'm um, afraid of a situation. How, And then I try to breathe, you know. You learn that in workshops, but it works. You have to breathe and um, remind yourself that others, if they would be in such a situation, they may be even more nervous and they may not even be willing to get into such a situation. But fear... I don't think I've experienced fear. I mean, if you look, you know, we, we took in four women from Ukraine into our house. If you want to know what fear is, uh, you talk to them. But I think many of us have never experienced real fear. I bet so, yes. So give us a snapshot of an ordinary moment in your life that brings you great joy. Music. I, I, I listened very, you know, there's only a few moments, maybe once a week or so. But then I, I turn on some music I really like, and I will not tell you which music that is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the last one. What is the one thing you're deeply grateful for right now? That has become obvious, I guess. It's, it's my wife, my kids, my family. Um, that's obvious. Okay, let's go to the question from the audience. And, you know, we have some here, but if you guys want to have any, I'm happy to, you know, read them and, you know, ask them to Patrick. So thanks for the insightful and inspiring talk. Couple of questions. One, sounds like the US and UK science academia system were a more flexible and open-minded back in the day. Do you think that that's still true? What could German academia take from them? What can they learn from German academia? Wow, that's, um, I try to be brief. So first of all, if it's still true, I don't know, because if I go now, I talk to colleagues, right? Sometimes 
to students, but I'm in a different position, so I wouldn't learn the things that I've learned at the time. What was great in the 90s, first of all, they really valued the young researchers. Everybody can contribute. And that's the message I always try to give to people. Even if you're here only for three months for an internship, you can contribute something, right? And second, um, you know, I remember that Alan first, he had 70 people, seven zero people in his group. But he would always come at four o'clock for tea. You know, this is British science, right? And so I get a chance to meet Sir Alan first and to learn the latest from him. You know, sometimes he told me these funny stories whom he met and so Nobel laureates, I couldn't believe the kind of world he lives in. But he was approachable. And I tried to do that here and I actually failed. I, you know, tried to take a coffee after lunch and to talk to people briefly, but my schedule was so full that I couldn't do that. And, and that is so great about British science that they meet for tea. Um, these are little things, you know, <laughs> but in the end, it's uh, the way we do science, at least in the life sciences, is very much according to the Anglo-Saxon uh, model. So we have a lot of things in common. And in what way did you fail here? You know, I didn't take or didn't have the time that I wanted to have for this, you know, just to chat over coffee. Of course, I take the time to meet with my people formally, like we have our research, you know, seminars, and then afterwards we have a, the discussion round, or I meet to prepare a manuscript or so. But just to meet without purpose, you know, mm -hmm. th this is also valuable because some ideas may be bouncing around and you come up with something good. And sometimes I manage, but just not in often enough. Back to serendipity. Right. Yeah, exactly. Back to chance. <laughs> yeah. no. So um, what would you do differently if you were to do it all over again? Oh, what would you do yeah. the same? To be honest, um, um, I would do the same. Because Nothing basically, different. basically, you know, the, the, the one thing that I think I understood now, at least that's how I perceive it, you take a decision. And then you deal with whatever's coming. Mm -hmm. It's not that, oh, I should have taken a different decision. There's no choice. Time runs in one direction. So, <laughs> and that's also why I would do, after, in that situation, all the decisions were right, I think. And then I dealt with them. That's a good way of thinking about it. Never thought yeah, about because it. it's it's a hypothetical question, but it's it's not an option. You know, there was a philosopher, um, I think, um, Kierkegaard, he said once, life is understood retrospectively, but unfortunately, we have to live in a forward right. mode. And this right. is exact, that's exactly how it works, you know. Sorry for this. Uh, that's exactly how it works. Um, you have to just um, take a decision and then deal with whatever's coming. I like that. I take that, you know. Very it's wise. better than taking no decision because that leads sure. to um you know an unsecure situation it leads to frustration it's always good to take decisions yeah that's that's true next question so thank you for an amazing interview you try to make the path for the next generation easier however many people in senior positions have the mindset because i went through this difficult thing you have to do it this way too what would you say to those people and I think I resonate um, with this person. There's a lot of those people. <laughs> yeah. I think I answered that question already when I said that, you know, I had fellowships. I experienced that it was not good, neither for me nor for uh, the whole system, you know, when you have to accumulate benefits and so forth. And it's also not good for young families. And so I tried to help to change it wherever I could. And I was really, I mean, that is a proven record I have. I was speaking up even when people said, uh, we want to keep the fellowships. And so um, I think this is really the worst argument you can possibly hear. Because what, you know, my grandfather was in the war in Russia, uh, World War II. 
So if he would have said, you know, I went through this, you should, all, it's totally stupid, this argument, I don't get it. The life has, you know, world has changed. By the way, I think the young people have entirely different challenges that we, but they have also great challenges. This idea that everything is simple nowadays, don't worry. It's not true because there's entirely different challenges. Think about climate change. Think about uh that we have too much information. Think about isolation. You know, people are connected all over the world, but they are lonesome. I mean, all of these things we didn't have, right? We had other problems. So I don't buy this idea. Uh, I don't, hopefully people believe me what I say. Next question. In the pre-modern period, many scientists consider science as a mental habit to be acquired through many years of study with the goal of perfecting their human being. As such, science changed their thinking, their outlook on life and the world. There is life's purpose. So in this vein, let me please ask, how has science changed you as a human being? What has it done to you, your thinking, your outlook on life and the world and the purpose that you may see in your life? That's a great question. And it's, um, it cannot be overemphasized how important that is because we can get trapped, you know, we all love to do science, right? And we love to be reasonable and we love to be evidence-based and so forth, but life is actually much more than this. Mm -hmm. And once we ignore the other part, when we think it's only about reason and it's only about causality and it's only about rationality, not only do we miss our life, but also I think we will, not achieve our goal to really contribute to this world in the best possible way. Because why are we here, right? We are here for purpose and that is to maintain our species. And that includes other living beings, right? That we need to live. We need to get food and all of it. So it becomes a bit philosophical, but we are all connected through space and time. We have the same ancestor. We know that from evolution theory. And it's, it would be a huge mistake to think that only rationality and only scientific purpose and only causality is what life is about. We all know it in our hearts of heart, right? But it's a danger to have a, I would call it cultural one-dimensionality. It would be cultural one-dimensionality. And we must do everything to avoid it because life is much more than just reason. I mean, why do we have emotions? to suppress them, come on. We got them through nature to enjoy life, to also recognize dangers, all these things. And so the answer is, it's great to be a scientist. It helps you because you can distinguish facts from fiction. But if we would only be scientific minds, we would not only miss life, we would also behave in a way that is not entirely beneficial. Mm -hmm. And you can, I mean, I could give you many examples. One example would be just one sentence. You know, we, we close all the schools because of the coronavirus, because we only measure infectivity. Mm -hmm. But you have to balance. Now we realize retrospectively, you know, many of these kids became mentally ill. Many of these kids are retarded in their learning. Many of these kids need now help to be social people. So life is more complicated than this one dimensionality. And this is also why during my leadership, we will keep the breadth of the science. So this idea, you know, the data-driven science, for example, that's the only real science and everything else is nice to have. This is totally wrong. It would lead to a cultural one dimensionality that we will regret. And this is why I will protect humanity, social sciences, and also, uh, you know, we will think of new ways, new fields to establish. For example, what about ethics? We don't really have much ethic. We have law, um, but actually, what is the basis of our laws? It's ethics, right? If we wouldn't agree on what we consider to be right or wrong, we cannot even make laws. So I think we also need to establish a few new, that doesn't need to be institutes. It could be research groups. It could be uh, departments. Sorry, this is a long answer, but the question is very fundamental. Uh, thanks for the question. It's really important. Hey, you know, I, I, so this is Katia, by the way, Katia Krause. 
um, you know, it's, I think it's a really great question also because sometimes, you know, we overrate science. It is, it's so much more to life than science, right? And, and this is what you're portraying now. That, you know, and, and part of that is that even within science, we are not <clears throat> fairly oftentimes embracing pluralism, diversity of ideas, you know, and sometimes it, the, 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 the joy of understanding what things are to disagreement. You know, and, and truly get into those in a in a you know in a positive way, you know, not through fights, you know, but you know we we can get to see better if we see different perspectives. Right? So it's um, but it's a challenge. It's not easy. So um, <laughs> good luck with <laughs> doing the, the non the non dimension the non one dimensionality because I think that a lot of people like the one dimensionality. So no. Okay. Next question. What kept you in situations in which you have to make a very difficult decision? Mm. Yeah, first of all, uh, always sleep over it. You know, sometimes I, I, I get, you know, accused in an email or I get really strange phone calls or so. And then I'm like, oh, I have to do something. This is impossible. Always sleep over it. Next day, things look differently. Our brain integrates things and puts it into a wider perspective, you may wake up with the solution. So never take uh, important decisions without sleeping over it. Sometimes it needs several days or even weeks. Um, second thing, talk to people you trust. Uh, you know, I always try to get more advice than I need, and then I disregard some of the advice. Like I did, you know, for my postdoc. People tell me it's not possible. Okay, I... I have a different opinion. Other people saying mm, it's tough, but try. Okay, I take this advice, you know. So that's how I deal with it. But talk to people you trust. Danny Kahneman has a really nice book uh, recently published called Noise. And he has a sheet sheet called Decision Hygiene, you know, like where he actually talks about, like, you know, the, the test with this reliability. Ask yourself twice whether or not over time and when you accumulate more evidence, you make the same decision, which I think is the same point, like sleep over it. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, like the next time around, you ask yourself like, eh, how do I feel about this? Right? So I thought it was an interesting you know, idea there as well. Mm -hmm. All right, then next question. Um, hello, Patrick. Thank you for sharing your experiences. How were you motivated to join the academia and not industrial job after facing the difficulties to your PhD and postdoc? Yeah, it's quite simple. Um, first of all, I, I'm i curious. I'm a curious person. I want to understand how nature works. Um, and it's the most, for me, the most uh, rewarding thing to be the first to see a molecule or to understand how a process in the cell works. And I, you know, for that, you need total freedom. So when I was given a PI position, for me, it was a dream come true. And also it was so extremely hard work to set up the lab, to set up teaching at the university and all of that. Um, I couldn't have imagined to do that at, in industry, where in the end, you always have somebody to give you a, a framework, right? This total free or almost total freedom, where would you find it? I think in the end, it's academia. And we're actually protected by our constitution in Germany that um, the scientific freedom is, is as important as the free speech in Germany. So, and that is on the individual level. So an individual scientist, the state can never, for, you say you, you're not allowed to do this or that, unless you would violate a law, right? That is, of course, you cannot do that. But otherwise you're free to do your science. So we have only three minutes and we have two more questions. So take, you know, your time or decide to pick whatever you, you prefer from those. So thank you for this very interesting talk and share your amazing life journey with us. I have several questions. How do you persuade yourself to be positive when you meet great difficulty and disappointment in your research? Second, and what characteristics do you think are more important for young researchers like postdocs and PIs? Also, do you think the publication is the most important part of researchers' career? Thank you so much. Wow, a lot of questions. So let me see. I try to read that again. This the first the... one was, how do you persuade yourself to be positive? You know, I, sometimes I don't manage. But I get up in the morning not trying to think, oh, this will be, maybe there will be conflict. Oh, this is really difficult. You know, maybe they expect something else or so. I try to get up saying, 
I want to live that day, that one day and try to make a difference. You know, even if there's some difficulties, because I will not get that day back, right? This will be gone. So I try to be the best of myself. I not, sometimes I'm simply, despite three cups of coffee, I, I will fail. But um, that is how I try to be positive. And also you need to, you know, when your battery runs low, you have to take time off. You know, we go cycling or now we will go walking for a full week before I take office, actually 10 days, um, just walking. So uh, that you have to, recharge your batteries right to be positive otherwise you get into that you know same mood that some people around you may have um, to be negative second what characteristics are important for young um you have to find your own path you have to listen to your heart you have to um be ambitious but at the same time realistic and i think the most important is to communicate I often see great people who do all the experiments in a way that is much better than I could have done. But then they go to a conference and there's a Nobel laureate who may have good advice and they will not talk to that person. And the person stands there with a cup of coffee. And so you have to communicate and try to take advice and then you can always disregard it if you like. Um, and the last question publication is most important yeah you know we have a system where you have to somehow have to have a proven record but i think less publications which and which are more creative where you actually demonstrate independent thinking where you have a, followed a new idea even if it's not you know a top journal um, are more important and i will certainly introduce more uh, you know, an evaluation scheme that is not counting numbers, because there's many things that cannot be uh, measured, but still count, right? And so uh, I think we need a little bit of a change in the system. But of course, you have to have some kind of proof that you have to been active, that you have developed ideas, that you have to try to solve a big problem. And but it's not about having as many papers as possible. It's about, you know, having a made a few important contributions and to be able to demonstrate that. Sometimes that can be a great talk also with a perspective when the paper is not yet accepted or so. Um, but you have to somehow demonstrate also that your ideas are valid and that you're on a good track. Great. It's 6.31. And I don't want to you know, stretch more of your time, but I just want to really deeply thank you for taking the time to talk to me and to us and for sharing, you know, like your, you know, very interesting career path. And, uh, and I look forward for all of the things that you learn along the way, because I'm pretty sure that you're going to put them in good use for your next presidency and you're going to change the next generation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank well, you. I thank you, Lucia. I um, think uh, you did a wonderful job preparing for that i was really challenged and at the same time i really hope that um some people can take some of that advice or they understand better you know why i am the way i am because obviously life is shaping your personality in german we have a nice word which is called bildung and mm -hmm. people mistake it because they think it's learning a lot of things right? it's education you know but actually, Bildung is Formung in German. It actually means shaping, shaping mm -hmm. uh, your personality. And it's, um, you know, if we can encourage young people to shape their own personality, do something for themselves by facing the challenges and taking a decision, then uh, I think it's worth doing that job. And I, I thank you for being such a great uh, moderator and uh, for doing this whole series. I'm sure you have influenced many young people. Thank you, thank you. And I also, you know, they need to tell you they learn, you know, a, a bunch of things, but I take two that are extremely important. Make a decision and don't look back. And no plan B. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Take care, everyone. And then I also on the um, chat, we are going to have Piola Prisman on April 24th. I look forward to then, you know, interviewing her. Take care, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a Have good, good night. Thank you. Ciao. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.